I tried to maintain a cheerful facade as my worry grew, but when he joined in the facade, dropped, and my jaw fell. There was something wrong with how right he sounded. The tone was beyond perfect. It wasn't mechanical though, quite the opposite. His violin sang with a humanity I'd never heard before. The voice was operatic, and listening closely I could imagine lyrics being sung from it. When we decided to end the tune, our audience cheered. I introduced myself, shaking the man's hand. He told me his name was Terry, though now I believe that was an alias. I asked him if he had any requests, but he just shrugged and said, It didn't matter, I'm just here to play. The restaurant had been closed for an hour when we decided to pack it up. There was still a crowd of roughly two dozen who were sorry to see us go. I apologetically told them I would be there tomorrow, then Terry's face lit up. He asked what time. I gave him a rough estimate since I didn't have a strict schedule. He said, see you then, and walked off before I could say anything else about it. When I walked back to my apartment, I put on a record, then started getting ready for bed. But the memory of Terry's melody itched the back of my brain. The more I thought about it, the worse my vinyl recording sounded in comparison. Eventually, the imperfections of the record bothered me so much that I had to turn it off. Even the silence that followed sounded out of tune. Every day for the next week, I showed up to the restaurant to find Terry already there playing. I'd fight my way through the crowd to the piano, join in with him, and play into the night. We made more money in tips playing together than I did in total playing sets with Miles Davis. Often we would have had to sub out and take a break to empty our, empty our tip jar into a larger container inside the restaurant. If I hadn't gambled most of it away back then, I might have been pretty well off today. It was that kind of money. Around the third or fourth day of playing with him, I also realized that I'd never seen him tune his instrument. Usually after half an hour or so, it's a good idea to tune a violin. At least, that's how I understand it. If you don't, the finger positions on the instrument will be different for each note. Pretty sure it messes with the tone, too. But even though he didn't tune, the violin's sound remained pristine. On Saturday, late into the night, I finally decided to ask what his deal was. I believe it came out something like, How the hell do you get your notes to sound so perfect? Which is when he told me the proverb I often tell you. I don't make notes. I make sounds. That made no sense to me, so I told him I don't follow. He explained it to me. I suppose this was something you were supposed to learn in music school because I had never heard it about it before. The way he taught it was that notes represent sounds. But the sounds a piano makes, like most instruments, are the sounds sorry, aren't the sounds those notes represent. You see, the pitch of each sound an instrument makes is based on mathematics. Each one is the result of a specific ratio using a central pitch. This is a crude way to put it, but as you play higher notes, the distance between the pitches changes. At this point, I was still confused, so he brought up his violin for a comparison. First, he played a chord, saying, this is what the piano plays. The harmony didn't have the usual sparkle I had associated with his playing. It didn't sound bad, it sounded just the same as any other violinist I'd ever heard. And this is what the notes truly represent. The next chord was the same notes, but they just sounded better in a way that was hard to describe. It reminded me of the difference between a living flower and a preserved clipping. Both plants might look the same, but put them side by side, and your heart can tell the difference. I interrupted the chord to ask who had taught him to play. I remember specifically, he said, I taught myself, just like you. At that moment, this meant nothing to me. But now it sends chills down my spine since I don't recall ever telling Terry I was self-taught. Not satisfied with the short answer, I continued, specifically asking how he learned about the true note sounds and how he taught himself to play them. Terry sat silently for a moment. I could tell this was some secret, and he was deciding how much of it he could trust me with. 
After an awkward moment, he answered, I cut a deal with another violinist to teach me. A teacher? Not exactly, he concluded. I correctly assumed this was the last thing he was willing to say about the subject. We started divvying up the tips when Terry surprised me by stating that he wouldn't be able to join me here tomorrow. I told him it was no worry and that I would see him the day after, but he cut me off, saying, I can't play here anymore, ever again. I began apologizing, but Terry assured me it wasn't my fault, explaining that he was traveling around the globe and it was time for him to move on to the next destination. All I could say was, oh, then we continued sitting while Terry packed up his violin. When we stood up to leave, I told Terry, if he ever needed a pianist, I would be there. He got a look on his face, then something just occurred to him. I became friends with a club owner, he began quietly, like someone might hear, who told me he'd let me play there any time I'd like. Are you interested in one last night together? I was thrilled at the opportunity as the space would allow for a bigger crowd, which meant a bigger payout. I instantly agreed, and barely slept that night in anticipation of the show to come. The next day came and went. I headed over to the address Terry gave me an hour early. The gates was glowing in red neon lettering above an open set of doors. I didn't see any staff and was beginning to worry I had the wrong address when I heard a violin singing scales from backstage. After a bit of searching, I found Terry practicing. He jumped in surprise when I greeted him. When he turned to face me, I saw that he was drenched in sweat. Additionally, he had a familiar tenseness on his face, an expression I remembered from when we first met. I asked him if he was okay and if we should call off the show, but he just shrugged it off. The rehearsal went as expected, but it became more clear to me as we went on that something was bothering him. However, it was also clear that he wasn't going to tell me what it was, so I let it go. Before long, the distant sound of chatter and people sitting down signaled that our practice time was over. I got up and headed to the door, but felt a hand grab my shoulder. Listen, George, I need you to do something for me. I turned around, and Terry was there holding out a hand. He opened his fist to reveal two cotton balls. For the last song we do, I need you to put these in your ears. Don't take them out until you feel my hand on your shoulder. I have my own earplugs, I replied, but I doubt the crowd will get that loud. No, he yelled, and I stepped away, surprised by the force of his words. It needs to be cotton. It's part of the deal. Worried he'd call off the show, I conceded and took the cotton balls. We walked on stage together to a full house. The crowd cheered and I saw many of the regular attendees from our street performances, but something still felt wrong about it all. There was still no staff. I could see the bar from the stage, but nobody stood behind it. There were no waiters, busboys, or bouncers either, just an endless flow of people trying to find a comfortable spot to sit or stand. Ready? Terry yelled. I could barely hear him through the noise. We launched into the first tune, and my worry melted away. With each song, the audience would go silent. Occasionally, I would turn and look at the sea of gaping mouths and wide eyes. The faces stayed perfectly still like that while we played. When each tune ended, the silence died with it, and the audience would go ballistic. People were not applauding as much as screaming or howling. I almost put the cotton in my ears then, but it felt it would be better to follow Terry's explicit instructions. Before I knew it, we had made it through every song but the last. Terry turned towards me, waiting for me to fulfill my promise. He had been smart enough to choose a song that started with just him, and after a minute it was clear that he wouldn't begin until I obeyed. So I retrieved the cotton balls from my pocket and stuck them in my ears. I'm almost certain I should have heard something. The screaming from the crowd, maybe? But every sound dissipated. I was beginning to wonder how I was supposed to play like this when I heard Terry's violin clear as ever. I put my hands on the keys and was surprised that I could hear the piano too.